Hello there. I'm Kenneth Mayer from Boston, and I'm going to be talking today about HIV and sexually transmitted infections, addressing the current pandemics um, that we're facing. So these are my disclosures, uh, research grants from Gilead Sciences and Merck. So we have a global problem with SDIs. Uh, there are more than a million treatable SDIs that occur every day around the planet. And in addition to that, there are viral SDIs that are chronic. Uh, we can't uh, remove them from the body, such as herpes simplex. Uh, so there are um, a half a billion people uh, infected uh, globally. And many women have uh, infections that um, uh, can cause serious disease, such as HPV. Um, SEIs in and of themselves are a serious problem. Um, they can be associated with cancer, like HPV. They can affect pregnancy. They can be a major cause of infertility. Uh, for our concern at the meeting, uh, certainly increasing HIV risk, and they have an impact on the quality of life. In addition to that, uh, STIs and HIV are fellow travelers. Uh, the concept of epidemiologic synergy was first described uh, almost 30 years ago by Judith Wasserheit. This is part of a view of things called syndemics, coexisting um, epidemics. And you can see on the right uh, data uh, from New York and San Francisco. And basically, this is looking at men who have sex with men. And it's looking at their rate of acquiring HIV after an STI. And the rates are extremely high. Uh, almost one in five uh, um, acquiring um, um, HIV after a case of rectal gonorrhea within five years. So if we think about the old paradigm before the advent of a highly active antiretroviral therapy and PrEP, um, we could say that there were four factors that drove HIV and SCIs. The biology, the SEIs could increase HIV susceptibility through inflammation and ulceration. Behavior went in both directions. People who were engaging in condomless sex who had more partners were more at risk for HIV and SEIs. Epidemiology, subgroups of people uh, might have partners who are at greater risk. If you meet partners in, in a bathhouse, for example, more likely to meet partners with HIV or SEI. So this idea of a core group. And then HIV itself could cause immunosuppression, which would increase susceptibility to STI. In the current era, uh, things have changed a lot. Because um, undetectable equals untransmittable, uh, and because of PrEP, um, people may engage in uh, behaviors that increase risk. People may be part of a core group, but if they're adherent to uh, antiretrovirals, either for PrEP or for treatment, uh, they're not going to um, transmit HIV. Uh, so you have this unlinking of the risk for HIV and SDIs in the current era. The good news is that people are less likely to get HIV, but certainly still at high risk for uh, SDIs. And what we see is that people who are availing themselves, for example, of PrEP, um, are at high risk uh, for a number of um, SDIs, both bacterial and viral. And this is true um, uh, in data from uh, mainly resource-rich environments. But it's also true uh, um, in uh, places like uh, Thailand, uh, where uh, both um, HIV-infected people and uh, and people who are from community samples, all these individuals um, had very high rates of STI, and not just uh, Thailand and not just uh, um, US and Europe and um, other resource-rich environments, but um, several studies from Africa showed high rates of STI among men who have sex with men who are at high risk for HIV um, or living with HIV. And this is not unique to men who have sex with men. These data from uh, cisgender young African women also show very high rates of gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, so in the current era, we can't ignore SDI as we uh, make the advantages of antiretrovirals available to people. Uh, we also know that people who use drugs um, also are individuals who have high rates of SDI. And again, not unique to one part of the world, high rates in South Africa, Cambodia, and Kenya. This is particularly true with individuals uh, using crack cocaine, and transactional sex uh, may potentiate uh, these risks in people who use drugs. So for all the key populations, and uh, uh, certainly um, in Africa in general populations, SDIs have to be concerned as part of HIV care. So the drivers are multifocal, and some drivers may uh, be more relevant for some populations than other populations. We've talked about SDI inflammation ulceration. One thing unique for men who have sex with men and transgender women is what's called role versatility. In other words, receptive anal intercourse is the most efficient way of acquiring HIV and SDI. 
Uh, and you can see on the right um, the fact that not all individuals engage in only one behavior. Many individuals are so-called versatile. So somebody can be at high risk for acquiring HIV by being the receptive partner, being the bottom, and then they may be able to transmit to a new partner by being the insertive partner. So this is a unique uh, vulnerability uh, uh, for men, with men and transgender uh, women who engage in uh, penile anal intercourse. Um, and anal intercourse itself is highly efficient, but certainly penile vaginal intercourse uh, puts individuals at high risk for HIV and SCI. Uh, people who are, are socially marginalized may be more likely to uh, report depression, substance use. Um, people who've had bad experiences with the healthcare system may avoid providers, so their individual behaviors as well. Uh, their social networks. Uh, if people are in settings where they're more likely to have more partners over time, or that they're meeting partners in high-risk settings um, using sex-seeking sex apps, for example, or bathhouses, this will increase SDI and HIV risk. And then there's structural and social issues um, where people may be marginalized and not be accessing a care, which may be driving infections underground, not getting treated, and then being transmitted to new partners. Um, so how do we decrease HIV and SCI, this linkage? We can increase testing frequencies. We can create tailored services um, using new technologies. And on the right, you can see a computer pad and um, um, text messaging. And this is an example from Dean Street, a clinic um, for sexual health in London, uh, which has a walk-in facility that is mainly um, computerized and people um, can get their test results for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis within hours because they have um, a rapid turnaround uh, nucleic acid amplification testing facility. Culturally tailored services such as the Tangerine Clinic for transgender uh, people in Bangkok are also uh, great examples of how we can increase uh, people at risk for SCIs and HIV to come in for care. Integration of services is more and more the watchword uh, that we have to think about. And we need to train culturally competent providers we need to address the social and structural impediments. And co-location of services. So in addition to SDIs, if people who have SDIs are more likely to be uh, depressed and having behavioral health um, uh, referrals on site uh, and dealing with some of the economic insecurity issues that people may be facing. And then there are biomedical approaches too, uh, such as post-exposure prophylaxis and SDI vaccines. Uh, in terms of post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, the landmark study uh, conducted by uh, Jean-Michel Molina and colleagues in uh, France um, took individuals who were in an open label, on-demand PrEP um, um, study. Individuals were asked to take PrEP at times of condomless sex, taking two pills within 24 hours of sex and a pill a day for two days afterwards. And they nested into that study, a study of doxycycline uh, for uh, post-exposure prophylaxis um, because of its broad spectrum activity. And what they found was that the doxycycline uh, was quite effective in general if you lumped up the three bacterial SDIs together um, and particularly effective for chlamydia and syphilis, but no effect for gonorrhea. And gonorrhea is a concern because of anti-bacterial um, um, drug resistance. So we have to think about other approaches as well if we're gonna get a handle on gonorrhea. Uh, so the take home from the French study is uh, that uh, it is not time yet to routinely recommend doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, but there are other studies underway to look at long-term effects, uh, effects on resistance, effects on the microbiome. And these studies are going on in Canada, France, the US, and South Africa, though some MSM have already decided to use doxycycline for post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, one approach uh, that may be very exciting is trying to um, stop gonorrhea with a vaccine. There was an observation in New Zealand in a meningococcal vaccine study that individuals who got the vaccine were less likely to develop gonorrhea. There's some ecological data from Cuba, Norway, and Canada. Uh, and that's because there's a high level of genetic homology between Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis. Um, so uh, there is a vaccine called Bexero that is undergoing uh, studies now to see whether that will protect individuals against gonorrhea. So that would be a major development. Another approach, which is less technologically uh, sophisticated, but very interesting, is the idea that the oropharynx may be a reservoir uh, for gonorrhea transmission. And so uh, a group in Australia now is looking at whether asking people to use mouthwash after oral sex 
uh, may decrease rates of um, gonorrhea. Uh, so there are a number of approaches trying to get a handle on gonorrhea for sexually at risk populations. Uh, I don't have time in this talk to go into all the detail about new technologies for diagnostics, but this is an example simply to say that there are tests now that are being looked at that may be able to turn around a result in 30 minutes to test for gonorrhea uh, and chlamydia. And the tests can be done um, very quickly and very simply. Uh, so these tests are now being evaluated in clinics to see whether um, they are cheap enough, quick enough, uh, technologically feasible enough to be doing point of care diagnosis for sexually risky populations. Another approach is uh, developing machines that can identify organisms that may be drug resistant, uh, particularly for gonorrhea. Um, because if you can identify susceptible gonorrhea, uh, the organism can be easily treated with cheap um, um, generic drugs such as ciprofloxacin. So this is another technological approach coming down the pike. But in addition to technology, we have to do more community and provider education. So this is uh, part of a campaign uh, that has been done in New York City. Uh, the city health department has reformulated sexually transmitted disease uh, clinics as sexual health clinics. And they realize that these are places where people who come in with an SDI uh, should be offered PrEP, should be, if they test negative for HIV, if they test positive, they should immediately be linked to medical care. So this is so-called one-stop shopping. And this is the idea. It's a status neutral approach. So individuals who are sexually active, however they come into the system, if they come in for PrEP, they should be tested for HIV and SCIs. If they come in for SCI care, they should be tested for HIV. And then um, depending on their sero status, be offered the appropriate intervention. So the idea is creating um, a suite of services of sexual health for high at risk individuals. A very important public health effort. The essence here is cultural competence training. Uh, many of the people at risk for sexually transmitted infections are stigmatized. Um, uh, they may be experiencing homophobia, transphobia, uh, phobias about sex work. Uh, this can make individuals avoid uh, coming into care, avoidant behavior. So staff need to be trained so that, um, so that sexual health centers um, are perceived as welcoming environments where people wanna come in, get screened and get tested. Uh, there are a number of different resources available. Um, at our clinic in Boston at Fenway Health, we have a national center for LGBTQIA health education. I've listed the website below. It has a lot of resources for provider training. So one of the last points I'd like to make is that if we do this well, we actually may be able to decrease the rate of SDI. Uh, this is a modeling exercise by researchers at Emory University. And what they basically uh, found was that if enough people with SCIs uh, were offered um, um, PrEP and enough PrEP people were screened for SCIs, eventually you might have an impact on decreasing the rate of new SCIs. So the idea is that uh, PrEP may create incentives for individuals who are sexually active to come in for care, to get screened for SCIs, to get treated for SCIs, and then not to transmit SCIs to their partners. So this is the best case uh, scenario, but it posits actually uh, we can have a better impact on SDIs by bundling it more closely uh, to HIV uh, prevention and treatment services. So in conclusion, antiretroviral uh, undetectable un untransmissible campaigns and PrEP implementation, um, these have been associated with high rates of condomless sex, but they, they don't, um, the high rates of condomless sex do not undermine the high efficacy um, of PrEP and treatment as prevention against HIV. So given that reality, we really want to try to encourage people to come in for more frequent testing, early diagnosis, appropriate treatment, and better partner notification. This can really all have an impact. New diagnostic behavioral and biomedical strategies need to be tested, including vaccines. Integration of HIV SCI services may be efficient way to identify those at high risk for HIV and SCIs and we need to cross-train people in sexual health. Uh, we need comp cultural competence training for healthcare workers. We need community and individual empowerment. There's no one magic bullet, but integration and um, more innovation will be important. Thank you for your attention. I just wanna thank my colleagues.